career in the entertainment industry has enabled me to work with a diverse range of talent. Through my years of experience, I've recognized two essential aspects. Industry professionals, whether famous stars or behind the scenes staff, have fascinating stories to tell. Secondly, audiences are eager to listen to these stories, which offer a glimpse into their lives and the evolution of their life stories. This podcast aims to share these narratives, providing information on how they evolved into their chosen career. We will delve into their journey to stardom, discuss their struggles and successes, and hear from people who help them achieve their goals. Get ready for intriguing behind-the-scenes stories and insights into the fascinating world of entertainment. Hi, I'm Tony Mantour. Welcome to Almost Live Nashville. Today, we are privileged to have Taylor Dane join us. Taylor's debut single, Tell It to My Heart, propelled her to fame globally in 1987, followed by six U.S. Top 10 singles, two Grammy Award nominations, an American Music Award, and multiple New York Music Awards, along with several New York Hall of Fame honors, ranked 18th on Rolling Stone's list of the best female dance artists of all time. It's definitely an honor to have her here today. Welcome to the show. Not at all. I love it. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. So have you ever been sitting around just talking with your friends, talking about your careers, and then you just realize with your body of work that you've done, you just sit back and go, wow, I've done that. It's a funny thing being an artist, isn't it? It is. No, I think life is a very interesting ride. And I think the more you experience and the more you put into it and the more you get out of it, it allows you to have those moments of maybe perhaps sitting back and saying, wow, look at my career. Look what I've achieved. Look what I've done so far. But those are far more rare if you're living in the moment, if you're living in the now. So there have been moments when I was on tour and and there's always been moments. I remember looking out at a plane and going, Jesus girl, (laughs) you know, or being on that tour bus and going, wow. Sure, I'll have that moment in September when I'm back on tour and it's Paula and I and, you know, Tiffany. And and it's just, there are moments where you can take it away, but I'm still so living in the now. There's dreams come true all the time. Yeah, that's true. Pinch yourself, but then I never look at myself like I'm the person. Yeah, I get that. I'm pretty grounded that way. I don't know. So you graduated high school, joined some bands went to college, was in a few bands. Then all of a sudden you started becoming yourself as a singer. So who inspired you to pick up that mic and start singing? Um, well, you know, if you asked me at five years old, I would have told you I'm going to be a rock and roll star. Okay. It was the radio. I grew up in New York. I was born in the city, raised in the Bronx a little bit, and then we moved into Long Island. So that was the early 70s. Lots of great music back then. When you remember turning on WABC radio, because see, those are some of the jocks that in our time were like the great biggest radio jocks in the world. Um, Cousin Brucey, I just remember all these sounds. Oh, yeah, great sounds. Cousin Brucey was all a part of that. Talked with him a few times. Great guy. And I got my dad, it was it was a Sony, like kind of like, cube it was this coolest thing like think of the late six early 70s like it was a cool little modern he goes this is a radio and i'm like okay i know i was five i know i was four because music always waved, waved through the house it was always my parents were very um were avid um theater goers and uh they exposed me to music and the arts very young in my family and that was their thing whether it was like man of la mancha playing on or the fantastics sunday was the one day Sunday was the one day yeah. <laughs> where at least the family was together. My father, at least we, we knew we could see him and maybe I could walk to the bakery with him and pick up more pleasant memories and music would be playing. And the first records I ever got were Crosby, Stills and Nash, the Beatles and Stones from my parents. I remember hearing my Sharia more and I just said, who is that? What is that? And my ear and And then I just started seeing what these people look like. And they were obviously stars and music. And I said, I want to be that. Yeah, because the way that we looked at the stars back in the 60s and the 70s is completely different than the way the stars are looked at today. God, in the 70s, you could have anything from Karen Carpenter, Billy Preston. Exactly. Aerosmith Smith broke, Three Dog Night. Think about the pop artists. Oh, yeah. And what was on the radio, there was such an algoration of so many so many artists, rock and, and pop, if you will. The great thing is you could hear all those artists on one station. 
one station. Yeah, I remember you could hear Joni Mitchell in the morning. Then later on, you could hear Aerosmith. Yeah, those days were just great at radio. Right. Or Billy Preston. I mean, it just, or the Beatles, you know, well, not really the Beatles. I'm, I'm talking about early 70s is where I started really tuning in. Yeah. But everything and anything that was played on there was quite, you know, earth, wind, and fire. Exactly. And I started getting vocal choices changed, but th that was time. So how much had you been involved in music in high school? Because when you got out, that's when you really started to expand. Well, I get out of high school. I've already been in a band or two during high school and then obviously singing and doing solos and, and really focusing on my voice and, you know, the guitar player boyfriend and the whole thing. Yeah, sure. I just don't join a cover band. I kind of strike out there and say, I'm in New York, I'm in the playground of it all. It's where everything's happening. And now you're talking about 1980. Yeah. 81. I'm already hearing a pop station that breaks uh, 82, 83, and that's um, Kiss FM. That's for, for me, I had KTU in the city. We had the rock stations, LIR, and, you know, that's what... I gravitated towards the Zeppelins and the bad companies and the singers that had more rhythm and blues influence. But rock was a big thing. And then Southern rock came along. And then me saying, I don't want to be in one more band and one more person. And then New Wave was just the hugest thing in the world. And I was in this band called The Next. Okay. Well, then I was in a band called Felony. And every club you can imagine. I mean, live music was how you played. Yeah, I love those times. You went live, band, and an art. There was no... It was my brothers that went schooling, coming out with lighting designing degrees. Yeah. So when did you start writing? It seems like when that happened, everything started to change for you and it was upward from there. Well, also more of a producer, like my partner. So I met Rick Wake probably in 1986. All right. And now I'm out of high school like four years. So now I'm 22. And by then I was like, I don't want to do a band ever again. I don't want five opinions. And right then you started seeing I was really in the club and culture scene in New York. Like I was going down to 8th Avenue, that's St. Mark's and everything you see kind of like where Madonna kind of got that street stuff and everything that was going on in the cat club. And my brothers were DJing and also now VJing. And that was just like from private eyes to dance interior to the Saint and these clubs in limelight that were like the epitome Yeah. and what drove. But there were even bigger clubs that were happening in the middle of the night through six in the morning. And that was like Paradise Garage. Right. And so I started getting into house music and, and really going there in the middle of the night after I was doing my sets at a Russian nightclub down in Brighton Beach. We go into the city afterwards. And so tribal, house, that stuff. And then I met Rick Wake. Rick came in. He was 19. He was from Birmingham. He's like, this is what we did. Yeah, I get it. It's like all cylinders were on. I'm like, I need to do a single. And that's what started breaking through. And we could get on those mix shows, those 12 o'clock midnight mix shows. Yeah, great plan. If I had a single and then I was like, well, it looks like it's easy to break out. No, the DJs might support you in the clubs because the clubs were the biggest thing then. Yeah, that's right. You get the clubs, you have a chance to get on radio. Absolutely. Radio, not was dictated by the clubs, but so Rick was very, once we started collaborating, he was like, we need a crossover record, a record that can go right from the clubs. We can get the pools, the dance pools. I mean, it was a whole strategy. And that's how I went, how, how Leslie started with 12 inches and I'm the one you want. So this is the writing. This is the producing. It was far more than that. Producing, writing, and really uh, honing in on my craft. Your 10,000 hours, they were built like nobody's business. Yeah, a lot of work. You know, singing and session singers were some of the greatest guys we were bringing in from Trenton and things like that. And that was like the Billy T. Scotts. They taught me arrangements. Definitely a need to know. When Mariah broke, I mean, she just took them on the road. But I mean, I'm just trying to tell you, these were these sections. Yeah, they were great rhythm sections for sure. It was all growth, like you're 19, you're 20, you're 21, 22. I just knew I didn't want to be in a band anymore. I felt like it was counterproductive to getting right to the heart of the matter. So make your own and build your own and they will come. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you'd been writing for a while, and then all of a sudden you got a Tina Turner cut. That must have felt really good. Oh, later on, sure. Well, I was writing for myself. That record's called Whatever You Want, and that was during my second album. I was really more adamant about getting my co-writes on there and, and pushing for that. And it's a song I wrote with, uh, um, oh, my God, yeah. See the writers on that. That's one of the great producers of the time, Arthur Baker. Arthur 
was such a great promoter, but at the same time, Arthur was like, took the first Stones remix and put it in the clubs. Yeah, that was cool. You don't take the Stones and then remix them into a 12 and should put them in the clubs, but that was what Arthur had done. And then once I had a fame with Tell It To My Heart, then the Diane Warrens were coming. Yeah, that's great. I met and I was working with him and uh, we wrote this song. Yeah, whatever you want. For me and for my record, my album, my label passed on it, Clive, and those guys just didn't think it was it. But I guess Tina did. Yeah, she sure did. So... There's a lot of people out there that try and do different things. How did you put the writing into it, the production into it, and all of the development that it took to create that one project that made the difference for you? This is me saying bravo to two 21, 22 year olds, Rick, myself, knowing that to invest in yourself is the greatest thing you can do. Absolutely. When you have that small amount of money, if you keep trying to wait for something to happen to you, you will be waiting a long time. Yes, that's so true. So we built it. Rick was adamant. We went to my dad. We drew up a contract for five, $6,000 to do Tell It To My Heart. That was a song that Rick a and I went to high school with this kid that I saw on the West Side Highway because I was in the city all day and night. And he was while I'm working at Warner Chapel. And let me see if we can send a tape over. And that's when he was like, we need something that is a crossover appeal. Let's put our money into that. And so it was the production aspect, not just writing. It was being a producer, knowing that this is what was to be funded. And then knowing the pools and the promo people to get to. And like, it wasn't just an artist sitting in a room and, and figuring out my craft. This was, this was a science to the music business. And that's the part that I never want to take away. Like, and I, so I still look at things today. And sometimes people say, well, you micromanage and you're thinking like that. And I go, but that's how I'm here today. Nobody handed me on a plate. Nobody discovered me. And all those clubs I sang in, nobody walked and said, you're the singer. You're, you're it. You're the best. No, they did not. Yeah, a lot of people think that it's like the movies. Someone walks in, sees a person playing on stage, and then just hands them a million dollars and they got it made. They don't realize the countless hours that it takes in production, development, radio, promotion, and all the chain of people that it takes to make a hit record. Oh, for sure. And I mean, in those days, we didn't go on The Voice. We didn't go on. I mean, there was Star Search, I guess. Yeah, I guess. TV was this miraculous thing where you went on. I mean, but these kind of show the formulaics, like it always had that. But when I broke in the 80s, I mean, I opened up how I found Rick Wake was through The Village Voice. And you saw ads. So true. There was no internet. There was no phones. There was nothing like that. You actually had magazines and papers. And for me, the artists and the people that I wanted to work with were in the Village Voice. or And that's how at my first audition with Jive Records, that was a nothing label. <laughs> Tommy Boy, nothing. You think of them later, 10 years later when they were in sync and coming together. But these were how we all, we all were grassroots and started. That's how a lot of acts in those years started. Really, putting our money, either they were UK based. Where I broke first makes sense. I broke in the in Europe first. Yeah, that makes sense. So they took that single and they, tell it to my heart, put a Taylor Dane on the cover and didn't even put my, my image. And I uh, said, let them figure it out for themselves. And that's where dance has always really kind of been embraced European from even from that to EDM and how it really is built. Right. What I saw in the clubs was more tribal, was more R&B, was more urban, what was going on, which later what they called the speed of tell it, uh, tell me, can you love me? The first songs I put out, one, two beats per minute. So that this is 85. That was considered hip hop. <laughs> yes. Yes. It was kind of crazy. That was this genre. Now we call it freestyle. Right. That was Alicia, all my passion and all these songs that were breaking. And then I said to Rick, and then you start hearing, I'll never forget saying to Rick, and he goes, well, we need a crossover song. And I remember hearing all of a sudden this, I heard Aretha Franklin come out with a record all of a sudden. I was like, who's Zoom and who? Or like, I heard all of a sudden classic vocalists from the 70s that we knew. Aretha, of course, but Natalie Cole with like Freeway of Love for Aretha, then Pink Cadillac. And I'm like, who is doing this? What is going on? And then, of course, Whitney broke. Probably 85. Yeah, I think you're right. And then Charday. And these were the these were the voices I was like, all right, somebody's getting this. And it was Clive and it was Arista Records. And that's who ultimately signed us with the single, My Heart. So I'm always interested in hearing the differences in which the way that singers handle that sudden burst of success. I've worked around some that have been so busy and so scatterbrained that they didn't know where they were from one day to another. And that's true. When you broke with your single, 
and then all of a sudden the world just went crazy over it. How did that affect you and your perception of what you thought it would be and then to the reality of how it actually affected your day-to-day life? Oh, man. Nobody can prepare you for that. Yeah, so very true. Because it's not really overnight stardom. It's something you you've dreamed and built and built and built. And now I'm 22, 23, and I've got to quit the Russian club. I got to make sure I can support myself and Rick because basically Rick was living in the bottom of the studio. And this is happening so slowly and then so quickly because suddenly you're wanted in another country. It's not like it happened in the States first. I was wanted in UK. I was wanted everywhere. And I was separated from Rick. And then it's like, Rick, you sit in the studio here in in America, in the US, and then I'm off everywhere being the front of this. And I'm just the girl from the Russian nightclub that was hanging out with all these mobsters and they are throwing me in and out of Europe. So I hate to say it, but that's where I learned my Versace, my Godier, all those looks, my hair. Everything you saw was a product of hanging around people that had a lot of money real quick, real fast. Yeah. All bets were off and they showed me like, and that's how I learned Europe real fast, going shop three suits and Godier and, and then Alaya and... I knew it was fashion, and that's the first Taylor Dane you saw with the powerful, with knowing where my song came from, who it came from, how it derived, and and that was Tell It To My Heart. So it was this fierce, like, explosion that took place. How do you deal with that? You have a lot of boyfriends in different countries, and you try to find, you anchor yourself. My one biggest anchor was my girlfriend, Diane Jones, who was a singer as well in the club, that I said, I'm going to get famous. And she goes, okay. And she was eight years my senior. And she was an incredible singer. Diane Jones was my winger, my my rock. Yeah, it's great to have someone in our life that has our back. I'll never forget, I wouldn't even know a song. Like, if you asked me to sing Amazing Grace, she was black, she was a fierce, she was just my sister, my soul sister. And I'll never forget, when I looked at her and I was going on the wine and she goes, you draw all this out. I go, what does that mean? She goes, you go to church on this. And I was just, every club, every every radio station I went into, Diane was by my side. Until the record company started catching up to what they had, they signed me for a single, single option album. They had no idea. Yeah, that happens. Tell Tomorrow started going number one throughout all of Europe, then Pacific Rim, Southeast Asia, it was South America. Yeah. We didn't even have an album ready. Really? Just records that I, same writers did Prove Your Love. What a shocker. Yeah. Don't Rush Me was the song that I was doing. I sang as a demo singer <laughs> for the, one of the writers. It was mind blowing. Some of those songs, I have one of them upon the journey's end and, and another writer, another on that song is somebody that I worked with in the Russian club. I always said, wow, you're a great writer. I'm going to put you on. I mean, it was, it's, it's astounding. Yeah, it is. But uh, a great collaboration and it worked. How it comes together. But it was Rick and I, and then Diane was my anchor. Yeah, that's great that you had her. And we all over the world together. That first two years at 87, 88, until they really understood and we could put a full record together. I mean, it was wild. Yeah, it is. So I understand that you're getting ready to go on tour now. That's a fast forward. <laughs> yeah, well, now go by. Let's go 35 years later, you know. Yeah, that's the beauty of my time machine. Many tours later, many incarnations later. And I hit the streets with Paula Abdul. We do our Canadian run. We start September. Kind of full circle, isn't it? Sure is. Sure is. That girl was my choreographer. I mean, she was just phenomenal. Obviously, Janet broke before me in control. And watching that and Paula, and then Paula was my choreographer for Prove Your Love. Yeah, how good is that? Like, well, that's it. You, that's She's the top of the game, you know? I'll never forget when she came down to set and we were working on it. And then when she broke, ultimately, like, I think a couple of years later, it was straight up. That, it was pretty amazing. Yeah, it sure was. So when you look back, is there anything that just stands out to you? It can be an award, a performance, someone you met, someone you performed with, just anything. What stands out to you that if anyone asks you, that's one of the top few things that comes to your mind? It's so interesting, a question like, I don't know, there's been those joyful moments where you meet people, you know, where you're in the backstage and where you walk out and you're getting your, your throat looked at and there's Tom Petty and there's Steven Tyler and you get to talk and we're just in the same office. Yeah. Moments and they're like, hey, what's going on, Taylor? And then there's just been those sweet, gentle, more gentle moments or bigger moments, Prince. I mean, there's always been moments. Yeah, that's the great part about this music business is you have those moments where you meet those stars, those iconic stars. It's just great. Those are those moments that I guess 
if I think about them, I'll cherish them because they're so simple, but there's been euphoric moments where that last note of the show, you know, every night a show is different. Yeah, that's the beauty of the road. So in sync with the band and... Yeah, that's a great thing. It's just a feeling. It's a, it's an energy, it's a zest. I can say moments like that and I can tell you the antidote of that story and Prince walked down the stairs and then we screamed at each other. Yeah, those are awesome moments. There's a million of those, but but that doesn't take the... It's, it's the feeling. Yeah, those live events can give you such a great thrill and feeling. Accomplishment, I think that's that first question you asked, like, when do you get feelings? Those feelings come and go. I can, yeah, they do. You know, you work on them every day to, to, uh, to actually be able to receive that. Right. And sit on Benny Laurels because I feel I have so much to do. Accomplish, improve still, for whatever reason, that's that little girl and that voice inside me that's still got, got a lot to do. So you say you've got more to accomplish. So what's in your bucket list? What is it that's still there that you want to try and do and continue with your life? Bigger marks, bigger things, bigger territory, soundtrack. I've had a lot of songs and soundtracks, but now I want to, you know, the accolades and also actually sitting on things, more accomplishments that way. That way. Right. You know, Diane Warren and I have another song in us. Nice. Let's get her the Oscar. I'd like that myself. Yeah, why not? Certain things like that, moments like that and touring. Sure. You know, it's just more creative, things that creatively, you know, and even a TV is, a, I think I have a series in me. Yeah, that'd be nice. Just something, yeah, where I'm really, I get to really like say, wow, this character and I like really, we, we really blend and this is my voice and her voice. And I think that's, that would be an appropriate thing to say. Yeah, I could see that coming together real nicely. It'd be a, a lot of, a lot of creative fun and, and also finding another home. I love, what I love about touring is you're with your family. Really the energy, you're all for the good and for the good of the one project. And the project, and this is your family. It's like any team, and you can ask any athlete, they'll tell you the same thing. When the team and athlete, and, you know, we've trained. I'm training before I go out there. I'm training before this tour. I'm in the studio now. We're putting together. So when we're all targeted, it's like R, 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 we, 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 us, 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 us. It's an incredible energy that's what you see when you take this audience and you put your arms around them yeah there's nothing better they get you you get them and there's nothing no greater energy yeah and when the band and you are just perfectly in sync that special night and everything is flowing nothing seems to be wrong and even if you do hit that off note it goes right and there's just not a better feeling at all well, you just smile, turn around, and go, mother, <laughs> like, and laugh. Yeah. But it's all, you're in this dream together. Yeah, there's nothing better than that. So let's lighten it up a little bit. Favorite movie? I got to tell you, I have a few, but, like, let's just start, like, Pulp Fiction. Or most of them are so kind of sagas like that. Still Jaws, because there was something so simplistic, and the, the, the characters were just mind-blowing to me. Yeah. We need to get a bigger boat. I just love that line. Okay, favorite song? Well, I have the ones that I hold on to because they are the soundtrack of that little girl and what I hear. And those songs would be something like Wild World from Cat Stevens, Joni Mitchell, I would say albums. I couldn't even give you one song because it's not fair to say. It's, is it just Blue or Case of You? I know where I was the first time I heard Black Dog and I was just like, or where I was when I first heard Bad Company. And I i mean, this was a 13-year-old or a 12-year-old, but like smells around me, what the girl was wearing. She was wearing Love's Baby Sock. I remember that. Yeah, that's the power of music. And then the ones that took me to the next level. I mean, I can tell you Al Green, Marvin Gaye. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and let us not forget the young Michael Jackson, like just was, when I hear Never Can Say Goodbye, like I well up. Yeah, I get that. With me, the first person I saw on TV, it goes back to Elvis. My mother introduced me to Elvis, and that's what led me to getting into music. And from there, I just kept on going. And then from that, every person that influences you just adds to the story. And that helps you build your story with your song, and that's just great. That's why you're doing what you're doing. Absolutely. The love of music can bite us all. My parents bought me three records, so Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Sweet Judy, Blue Eyes. I still see that cover. And from there, that led me to Neil and Joni's and... People would listen to my music and go, there's no way, but believe me, there's way. Shaka Khan. Yeah, it's amazing how an influence of one or two singers that you hear can change one part of your song 
and then that can turn it into something really, really special. Well, I always was amazed that people, when they started responding to Tell It To My Heart, I was like, oh my God, I did a dance record. Like, this is so not what I thought I would be doing. That happens to so many different singers. But it allowed me to pull myself out of, like, again, that band scenario, like Deborah Harry, Patti Benatar, they were all, Chrissy Hine, they were all in this band, but they were my, like, Annie Wilson, like, you know, these were the my girls. And I was like, but I don't think I can do it with a band. I need to come out. And so boy, did I ever, I came out like a pop, like a, but I said, I'm not going to dummy down my voice. Like that was the big thing. Yeah, sure. Keep all that wild power. and Yeah. The great thing about that is that all the ones that you listen to influenced you to let you evolve into what you are now. 1000%. It just doesn't mean you have the time or you have the place to do it creatively. That's why when you watch these shows, it's amazing to me what Kelly Clarkson and Carrie Underwood, because they had a real sense of obviously what they were as artists and how they grew, because there's no way you, you really have to have a sense of yourself. I mean, their instrument is one thing, but like to really be able to take any kind of music and turn it into like your bitch, that's really why people love Jimi Hendrix. Absolutely. It's no way that guitar had, he had no mercy on it. Yet when he wanted it lilting, it, it just, it's the same thing with Greg. Like I never understand what came out of Greg Allman's mouth. I couldn't even believe the ache, the song, the, the territory. Yeah. In our lifetime now we have with Chris Stapleton, like it's hard to take a breath when they're performing. One of the bands I really liked was the Marshall Tucker band. When they performed live, they were just so, so good. And a lot of rhythm guitar. Yeah, they were pretty amazing live. You're right. You're right. Their live dynamics was so good. At one point, you're really struggling to hear them. And then the next moment, they're so loud, you're covering your ears. Yeah. yeah that's the beauty of music. You take all these nuances from all these other people and then pour them into that little kettle. And then all of a sudden, they all become you. you never could have imagined. Yeah, so true. Well, this has just been fantastic. I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, thank you so much. You really had great questions. Thanks so much. It's been really great. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the show. This has been a Tony Mantor production. For more information, contact media at plateaumusic.com.